Folks, good morning. Really warm welcome uh, here to the Burkhead Free Church building, if you're in the building, and uh, welcome online as well. I know there's uh, a lot of folks watching at home today, so uh, whether you're here or there, it's, it's great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Peter. Uh, I'm the minister here, uh, if we've not met. Um, if you are here in the building for the first time, um, a special welcome to you. A few things that we always say to, to guests. The main one is, is welcome, and we'd love to get to know you and give you a chance to get to know our church family. And uh, So if you're new, you might like to pick up a welcome pack. You'll find those at the end of the rows. Normally, I would say stay for coffee, uh, but partly because we're having communion today and partly because COVID cases are still pretty high in the area. We're just being a wee bit cautious. I know I said that last week, uh, but our plan is next week that we'll serve refreshments um, inside as well. So you're not going to freeze outside. But next week, we'll do refreshments together. Uh, and you can also connect with us online, especially if you're new. There's a page there, burkeheadfreechurch.org forward slash new, uh, which is set up for you. And lastly, if you're in the building for the first time, I've seen some of you doing this already, so thanks. But if you wouldn't mind scanning the QR code uh, that's around the building, and you can leave us your details for test and protect. And there are paper forms at the back as well, uh, if you'd rather do it that way. A few things to mention. If you've got a service sheet, you'll see the little blue notice sheet inside, and you'll see everything that's, that's coming up this week in the life of our church. But just to highlight um, a few things, um, come back and join us tonight um, uh, for our evening uh, service. We'll be con continuing our journey through Mark's Gospel, 6 o'clock. We'd love to see you then. Um, this is also a, a service of communion. We're sharing the Lord's Supper together uh, this morning. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed that. And uh, so if you're going to join in with that part of the service, um, then hopefully you've picked up uh, bread and wine from the back. Uh, and if you haven't, just find an opportune moment uh, during our service and you can go and uh, grab those. Uh, just to mention, uh, midweek this week, one thing to particularly highlight is that there's no uh, Wednesday midweek meeting this week. We often have small groups or a prayer meeting. There's nothing on Wednesday evening this week. And the reason for that is, um, uh, is Friday. So Friday during the day, you'll see that we have got our, our cafe day uh, with Christmas stalls happening here in the building, 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. So come along. Uh, there'll be refreshments. Uh, Donnie McLeod from the Faith Mission will be here with a great bookstore. We've got crafts. We've got a bit of jewellery, I think. We've got all kinds of things. So um, hopefully a really good opportunity for you to come and folks in the, in the village to come and join us. And uh, we'll be advertising all of our Christmas events um, as well on that day. And then on the Friday in the evening, Donnie McLeod of the Faith Mission is going to stick around and he's going to speak um, here yeah, in, in the church building uh, and give us an update on the work of the Faith Mission, which I know lots of us have followed for many years. So um, no Wednesday evening midweek because Friday daytime and evening uh, as well. Uh, just to mention too that um, the, the ladies meeting Christmas meal is coming up. That's a joint thing with the, the Ladies Guild at the Church of Scotland. It's on Tuesday the 7th of December, 5pm in the community hall. Uh, and uh, if you're going, you need to let Alison McPherson know, and um, really today would be good, um, but she needs definite numbers and payment by Tuesday. So I think she's contacted most of you, but if we've missed anyone, uh, see Alison today about that. And then finally, just to mention one Christmas thing that we've been, um, we've kind of been umming and ahhing about, uh, but we are going to go ahead with Burkhead Community Carols uh, on Saturday the 18th of December. We won't have a choir in the same way as we have in the past, um, but it will be a great night. So a bit of advance warning, we'll have flyers for you soon uh, and things like that, uh, but a bit of advance notice for that. Enough from me, you can see lots more on the sheet. But for now, hear these words from Psalm 105 uh, that call us to worship our God. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell, all his, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. The psalmist told us to praise God. That's exactly what we're going to do in the words of another psalm. My soul finds rest in God alone. Shall we stand? Let's sing. Strong against my foes, and I will. 
It's really great to have um, lots of the boys and girls back. I know you've been off school and some of you had COVID and stuff. So it's great to see you guys again. And um, before you go to Sunday school, here's uh, a quick video from me uh, about a little word that can become a big problem. Today we're going to think about a little subject that can make a big difference in life. And not a good difference either. Today we're thinking about this word. Now I'm sure you're learning your phonics. I wonder if you can sound it out with me. W -r 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 -y. It's the word worry. Now boys and girls, I know that in life there's lots of things that we may, might be a bit worried about. Things that play on our minds and make us feel sad, make us worry about what might happen. So today we'll think about worry. And I asked some children I know what things they might worry about. And here's what they said. I'm getting hit on the head by a football. Arguments with their friends. Getting hurt in the playground. Getting the virus. And people might be worried about getting sick or injured. about not having enough money. Now I love to go walking in the hills and in the countryside, but when I go walking, I don't ever load my backpack up with rocks like this. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? But you know, there's a verse in the Bible and by the way, remember, I'm sure you know that, that Christians believe that the Bible is God's book. There's a verse in the Bible that says, anxiety, that's another word for worry, anxiety weighs the heart down. So when we have lots of worries, things that we're worried and anxious about, it's a bit like carrying around all of these worries with us, all of these rocks to weigh us down. Oh, I tell you. That's not a good way to walk through life. And when you have lots of things to worry about, it's a bit like having one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, piled up on top of you. That's not an easy way to walk around, is it? All these worries weighing you down. Now, probably, you've sometimes heard people say things like this. Don't worry about a thing Cause every little thing gonna be alright But it's not always so easy just to stop worrying. Sometimes it feels like there's lots to worry about. 
So what can we do with all the things that worry us? The things that weigh us down like rocks in a rucksack or like boxes in our hands. Well, I thought I'd take you to our church building and we'll see if we could find an answer. Well, boys and girls, here we are in our church building. One of the things we have here behind me is a great big Bible. Can you see it? And that reminds us that, that Christians believe that the Bible is not just any book, but it's God's book. It's the way he speaks to us. That's what Christians believe. And so let me read you something from the Bible. It's something that Jesus said about worry. Here's what he said. He said, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, don't keep on stacking up the worries. We just need to worry about today, not tomorrow or the next day. But then the question is, well, what do I do with all my worries? There's still lots of things I'm worried about. There's still lots of worries in my rucksack weighing me down. There's still lots of worries in my boxes piling up. What should I do with them? Well, the Bible says the best thing to do with your worries is to give them away. You can do that by sharing them with other people. The best way to do that is, is to tell other people the things that you're worried about. There's lots of great people you could speak to. You could speak to your parents or, or grandparents, your, your grown-ups at home. You could speak to a friend. And I'm sure you could speak to a teacher at school. And you'll find that as you give your worries away, well, things feel much better. But Christians believe the best place to give your worries or the best person to give your worries to is God. He wants to hear how we feel and when we're anxious and we can speak to him. Here's another verse from the Bible just as we finish. It says this, cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. A cast just means give and anxiety, that's your worries. Give them to God. Christians believe we have a God who's ready and willing to listen so you can share your worries with him. I think that's quite enough of my singing, Keith. Thank you. Fantastic. Shall we pray before you go off to Sunday school? Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is always willing to listen to our worries and concerns. And we pray today you'd help us to bring our prayers to you and our songs of praise to you and help us to have listening ears to hear what you would say to us in return through your word, the Bible. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Fantastic kids, you're going to head out with your leaders to your Sunday school group. So on you go. And uh, we're going to carry on in prayer. Here comes Chris Harris, one of our elders. And then straight after Chris, Davy's going to come and read for us. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, we give thanks, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to come here this morning, either in person or online, to come under the teaching of your word and to give thanks and praise to you through song and prayer. Creator of the heavens and earth and every living thing, Lord, we marvel at your ability. You have provided for every need, not only physically, but spiritually too. An omnipresent God who is everywhere at all times. A Father who knows our every thought and deed before we have thought or carried them out. Lord, we thank you for the personal relationship that we have with you, the direct access we have, and we thank you that you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for all who would put their trust in him and call him their Saviour. Lord, you have paved the way for Christians worldwide to have a personal relationship with you through Jesus, and we give thanks that he now sits at your right hand interceding for us. 
Lord, we acknowledge your own shortcomings and sinful hearts which have turned from you. We thank you, Lord, that you love and care for each and every one of us. As we join together as believers in the act of communion this morning, we wonder at the magnitude of what Jesus has done for us, bearing the cost of our sin and taking our punishment for it, providing us with eternal salvation. Lord, we come in humble thanks and adoration to you this morning. Lord, as we think of the horrendous weather we have had in the past few days, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, those who, whose homes or property have been destroyed. Lord, comfort them, we pray, and ensure the provision of help and shelter for those in need. We give thanks for our emergency services too during this time and thank them for their efforts. We think of the Bulgarian bus crash this week, Lord, a bus travelling in the middle of the night Many passengers asleep when it crashed and burst into flames, killing around 46 people, including many children. Lord, we pray for those who have survived with lifelong injuries and pray that you would lead the medical teams who are caring for them. We pray to you for the families of those who have lost their lives as they struggle to find answers and come to, the to terms with what has happened. We pray to you for the loss of life in the English Channel as people so desperate to escape circumstances in their own country look to provide for their families and find a better life. Lord, in such circumstances, we acknowledge that you are in control. And whilst we don't know if there were any Christians on board, we acknowledge the brevity of life. Perhaps some had no thought for tomorrow or eternity, but were putting their faith in others and are now gone forever, fast forwarded into eternity. Lord, for those here today who have yet to reach out to you, work in their hearts, Lord. You have brought them here today or caused them to stream online, Lord, that they would hear about you and accept Jesus Christ into their hearts and lives as Lord and Saviour. We continue to remember those of our number suffering ill health, those who are lonely or have recently lost loved ones. Comfort them all, we pray, that they would know your presence in their lives. We pray for our Queen following her period of rest and we give thanks for her many years of service and Christian witness to our country. We remember those in government, both north and south of the border, and pray that you would grant them wisdom as they consider implementing new laws which are contrary to your teaching. As we come under the teaching of your word, we think of our individual circumstances. We think of our friends and family members yet to come to know you. Lord, by your spirit, challenge us, work in us and through us, Lord, that we would lead lives which are pleasing to you and ultimately lead to the expansion of your kingdom, this side of eternity. Lord, we also pray that you grant Peter wisdom this morning as he comes before us with your word. For we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's read together from God's word uh, from the book of 1 Peter, verses, chapter 3 verses 8 to 16. That's on page 1219 of the Red Church Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 16. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ 
may be ashamed of their slander. Amen. Thank you, Davy. Thank you, Chris, for leading us. Keep that passage open if you have it. And then let me pray that God would help us to understand what he's saying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words written so many years ago and yet to Christians in churches in such a similar position to us. We pray, Lord, that you'd open up this part of your word to us, that we'd be able to see what you're saying, that we'd be able to hear and receive your word and most of all, respond in obedience in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, picture the scene. Uh, You're there uh, in your workplace, or maybe you're at home, uh, or wherever it is. It's some place where you regularly come into contact with people who don't know Jesus. And there's a conversation happening. And uh, the conversation takes a turn onto a topic of some spiritual significance. Maybe the folks are speaking about contentment and where to find it, or purpose and where to get it in life. And you begin to get that kind of itching feeling. You know you ought to say something. You know that if you were more switched on or prepared, you you might be able to turn the conversation towards Jesus. You want to say something about him, but you don't feel prepared and you don't want to make some gear-crunchingly awkward move like saying, hey, if you want to be fulfilled, fill your life with Jesus. It's just me who's made bad ones like that. You don't know what to say, so you end up saying nothing. Or maybe you just end up nodding along with the kind of secular thinking that's been shared. And at the end of it all, you just feel useless. But then things get worse. Noticing that you're quiet, one of your colleagues turns to you and says, oh, what about you? You always seem to be a contented soul. What what does it for you? And now the pressure's really on. In football terms, the conversation has gone from being a half chance from outside the box to an open goal from six yards away. You really cannot miss this one. Surely you're not going to stuff this one up. You've really got to talk about Jesus. But again, you feel so unprepared. The, the whole gospel of the, sto- the whole story of the gospel kind of swims around in your mind. Half-remembered Bible passages, quotes from sermons. There's so much you could say that you just don't know where to start. Plus, you feel embarrassed because you're the only Christian in the room and you're worried that you're going to get a bit of hassle for what you're going to say. And so in the end, you say very little or nothing at all. And if anything does come out your mouth, it's just a a bit like a sort of trite little soundbite that's not really about Jesus at all. And then the conversation moves on and the moment has passed. And you stand there, metaphorically at least, with your head in your hands, feeling rubbish. You've blown it again. You've denied your saviour. You've been unwilling to speak for your Lord to lost people who are heading to judgment without Christ. And if you relate to any of that, today is for you. And by the way, if you think the description I've just given is scarily accurate, the reason is I have been there too. That happens to me too, still. Anyway, here we are in the the fourth and final session of Fruitfulness on the Front Line. You remember we've been working through this book Uh, called Fruitfulness on the Front Line. The idea is simple and biblical. Each one of us has a front line, some place where we're regularly in contact with those who don't know Jesus. And God has called us to be faithful on that front line, to live faithfully for him. And we, through the book, have been examining the different kinds of faithfulness he calls us to. So we've seen that we are to model godly character and make good work and minister, love, and grace. They all begin with M. And in fact, the book has other chapters as well that we've not had time to cover. So if you can get a hold of the book, you can read those as well. When we think about what the the kind of fruitfulness that, that the Bible calls us to, it is more than just evangelism. It's more than just 
sharing the gospel with those that we live amongst because how we live matters and how we work matters and how we love matters. So yes, we're called to do more than just speaking the gospel, but we're never called to less than speaking the gospel. It remains the case that sharing the good news of Jesus is the most significant and valuable thing you can do for anyone. Because as we saw last week, Jesus is returning. He's going to come back to bring everlasting life for those who repent and believe. And yes, everlasting judgment for those who don't. So the stakes are very high. Anyway, we're landing today in uh, the New Testament book of 1 Peter. Here, the, the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, is writing to a group of churches who are facing a bit of opposition from their culture whilst they're trying to serve Jesus. In other words, that their situation is actually quite a lot like our own. So we pick up in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Have a look. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called that you may inherit a blessing. Now, very helpfully, this actually brings us to a recap of where we were last week. It's almost as if somebody planned this. So two points of recap. You'll see them on your service sheet. First, this. Show love within the church, even when it's difficult. When Peter says, love one another, he's primarily talking about love within the church family. And the context for that command, in fact, the key verse in the whole book of 1 Peter is this, 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's fruitfulness on the front line. The way we live, including the way we love each other within the church, that is an important part of our witness to a world that is watching us more closely than perhaps we might think. Remember the gentleman I spoke of last week who ended up attending a Christianity Explored course here because he'd been impressed by the godly character and love shown by members of our church. So love is key within the church but it's not just second it's not just that here's the second recap now show love towards the world even when it's hostile so 1 peter 3 verse 9 now do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult on the contrary repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing again remember that the context is a church that's surrounded by a culture which is pretty suspicious of who they are and pretty hostile towards what they're doing. Um, In the ancient world, by by the way, um, you you could have many gods, and most people did, but the Christian claim that that there was only one god who reigned supreme was very controversial. Uh, In the Roman Empire particularly, uh, because as Roman citizens you were expected to worship the emperor as a god, which of course Christians couldn't do. And so they lived in a state that was suspicious of them and a government that passed laws that opposed them. Sound familiar? And in that kind of environment, Christians were often on the receiving end of mockery and insult. And you could understand them wanting just to to give as good as they got in return, right? To repay insult with insult, as Peter puts it. But Peter says, no, that's not the way of Christ. He's already shown us that back in chapter 2, verse 23. When they hurled insults at Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. To repay insult with insult, that's not the way of Christ. And, I mean, that would be reason enough, right? Do as Christ did. But more than that, this is also the best way to live to gain a hearing for the gospel. And he begins to say that in verse 13. He says, who's going to harm you 
if you're eager to do good. Generally speaking, says Peter, responding to evil with blessing is a productive way to live because on most occasions, not all the time, but on most occasions, it will enable you to live in peace. And on many occasions, it might lead to an opportunity to share the gospel. More of that later. On some occasions, though, no matter how much Christians bless, even those who persecute them, they'll still face opposition. Read on, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. And that really leads us to the one big central idea of this passage. It's our first point today. You'll see it on the screen, on your sheets. Set apart Christ as Lord. It's verse 14 again. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. The point is this. In some ways, the one central controlling question in life, the one thing that controls all of our actions is this. What do you fear or revere? What do you fear or revere? Um, As a young uh, 11-year-old footballer uh, training with the Newcastle United Academy, brag over, I was dropped by the time I was 13, But as a young 11-year-old footballer, we we were there, and there was one week uh, when we were having a a special presentation evening, and um, we were all in awe, because on this week, Peter Beardsley was coming from the first team to present the prizes. I did not win a prize, and then I got dropped. But anyway, that week, it would be safe to say that Peter Beardsley controlled my actions, I revered Peter Beardsley. There was absolutely no way I was going to miss that Wednesday evening training session. I was going to be there because he was. I revered Peter Beardsley and that controlled my actions. And it's the same in life. The things that you fear or revere will control you. And there's a, a direct choice being set up for us here in this passage. We can fear, or we could say revere, the world around us and we could let the world around us control our actions or we could fear or revere Jesus setting him apart as Lord and letting him control our actions now we've seen this already in the example that that Peter gives do we follow the ways of the world when we get verbally attacked Will we revere the ways of the world and just repay insult with insult? Or will we choose to fear and revere Jesus and follow his example who endured so much at the hands of evil men and yet never retaliated but acted in love and gave his life on the cross? We could ask this question on any number of subjects. Will we revere the world's view of money and try to get as much as we can or will we revere the way of Christ, the way of giving and not getting? Martin Luther said this, show me where a man spends his time and money and I will show you his God. You could ask it about any number of issues in life. We could see it in our views of sex and relationships. Will we revere and fear the ways of the world and see sex as a right that we have or a commodity to pursue or to trade? Or will we revere Christ and follow the teachings of his word? having relationships with other Christians only, or one other Christian only, and only living with and having sex with our Christian husband or wife. What we fear or revere controls us. And Peter says, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Revere him. And it's a good question for us to ask and for me to In what areas of our lives are we revering the world and not Jesus? 
who we revere will deeply affect everything, including the way we speak. It's a big theme here. So here's number two. Speak to commend the gospel. We have jumped ahead of ourselves down to verse 15, that bit about revering Christ as Lord, and we've done that because that's the key idea in the whole passage. But now let's just rewind a second. We're coming to this idea about speaking and communicating, (laughs) easy for me to say, the gospel. The gospel is a message to be spoken. But before we get there, Peter has something else to say more generally about how we speak. Look at verse 10 now. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now that is a quote from Psalm 34. You might ask, well, why? Why does he quote this at this point? Again, remember the setting. The churches who got Peter's letter were facing opposition from the culture. They were being slandered and ridiculed and insulted. And so Peter quotes this psalm again to reinforce the point that the church must not meet fire with fire. That if the culture slanders the church or insults the church or ridicules the church, we must not return like for like. We must keep our tongues from that kind of deceitful or evil or slanderous speech. Why? Firstly, because it leads to peace and not conflict. It's verse 11. Secondly, because we know God is a righteous judge who's examining our conduct. That's verse 12. And thirdly, because we want our behavior and our speech to create the kind of environment where people will be willing to listen to us when we share the gospel of Jesus with them. The point is this, if we always give as good as we get with our speech, if we spend our lives attacking others with our speech, if we spend our time getting into needless arguments and slanging matches with our speech, Do you really think people will be willing to listen to us when we talk about Jesus with our speech? Of course they won't. So set apart Christ as Lord, speak to commend the gospel. Thirdly, live to provoke gospel interest. Now we're driving towards verse 15. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord... Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, typically, when we read that verse, we jump straight into talking about evangelism. We could get off onto a whole thing about how best to share the gospel with your friends and family, and we're going to do that in a minute. But very importantly, notice how the verse starts. Look again. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason. Did you spot it? Peter assumes that people, even people in a hostile culture, will ask us questions about our Christian faith. He assumes that people, even people in a hostile culture, will want to know more and will come to us with questions about the gospel. Why? Why will people ask us about Jesus? What will provoke their interest? I think the answer is, well, everything Peter said so far. The answer is actually everything we've seen in this series so far. When we live in fruitful ways on our front lines, so when we model godly character, it will seem unusual and unexpected, and I guess it might provoke questions. When we make good work, that might seem unusual in your workplace. And it will, we hope, produce questions. When we minister love and grace to those around us, when we go the extra mile, it will seem unusual or unexpected, and we hope it will provoke questions. And, as Peter says today, when we're insulted but respond in kindness, that will seem unusual, and it will provoke questions. Now, both Davy and his wife, Emma, 
used to work for UCCF sharing the gospel with students on campuses. And I say that because UCCF have what I consider to be, in my humble opinion, one of the best strap lines of any Christian organization. I'm saying this, I hope it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed, good. Living and speaking for Jesus. And the point here is that those two things always have to go together. So if you live a life of kindness and goodness, but you never speak about Jesus, people will just think you're nice. And any glory will go to you and not to God. And none of your friends will be saved. On the other hand, if you blab on and on about the gospel, but if you live a life that's no different to the world around you, firstly, you'll be a hypocrite. And secondly, nobody will want to listen to you anyway. Because if your life is no different, I guess it won't provoke any questions. And you won't have any opportunities in any case, do you see? Lastly then, number four. We finally got to it, perhaps most importantly today. Speak to communicate the gospel. So verse 15, one last time. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. See what Peter says? Be prepared. The question is, are you prepared? Are you ready? Do you know the gospel? Picture the scene. Imagine that you're, you're standing on a bus stop and uh, the bus is going to be there in two minutes if you believe the timetable. Let's work on the fiction that the bus is going to be on time. You've got two minutes and a friend comes along and stands at the bus stop with you. This friend's not a Christian, but they know you've got a church. And they say to you, listen, we've got two minutes. I've always wanted to ask you, you know this Christian faith that you have, what's it all about? If you had two minutes and a friend with a listening ear, could you explain the essentials? Or what about kind of what we might call common apologetic questions? I reckon that when we speak to folks about Jesus, there are probably what, four, five, six very, very common questions or objections that people might raise. Things like, how do you know there's a God? Or who is Jesus? Or what's the purpose in life? Or if there's a God, why is there suffering? You know, there's a few questions, less than 10, I would guess, that most of us will most frequently be asked. Are you prepared? Would you have something to say? And then last of all, when it comes to sharing the gospel with those around us and, and being prepared, I think sometimes we're wary of having a framework and we're right to be suspicious of a framework that says when you share the gospel with someone, it must happen in exactly this way and in exactly this order because real life and real conversation is not like that. And yet when it comes to being prepared, uh, in the book F uh, Fruitfulness on the Front Line, uh, the author Mark Green suggests um, a four-step process to have in your mind. Now, I have improved it for you by making it rhyme. So you can thank me later. The four-step process is this. Prayer, care, share, now where? I should copyright this, shouldn't I? Prayer, care, share, now where? The principle is this. If you want to speak to others about Jesus, what's the first thing you should do? Pray. Pray for opportunities. I forget who said it, but someone once said, when I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. I've found that to be true myself. When I pray for opportunities to speak about Jesus, more often than not, they come along. So prayer. Secondly, care. At the risk of repeating where we were last week, if we don't have meaningful relationships with folks who don't know Jesus, and if we're not going out of our way to get to know them better, to express love and care for them, to, to connect with them more deeply, again, chances are we won't end up with a chance to speak about Jesus. So prayer and then care. And, and, and by the way, I, I reckon most of us, if we sat down and thought about it, could pretty quickly come up with a list of four or five people who don't know Jesus, who we're regularly in contact with. I don't know, maybe you work in an office, small office. Maybe there's a team of two or three others in there. 
who don't know Jesus. Maybe you know your next door neighbor pretty well and they don't know Jesus. Maybe it's a family member. Prayer for these people. Care for these people. And then share. If you're praying, if you're caring, I think God will bring you opportunities to say something about Jesus, to share something of the gospel with them. Now, it's hard to script this, and we wouldn't want to, because these are real friends and real relationships and real conversations. But moments will come to share something. And I think sometimes we think, oh, I don't have a degree in systematic theology. I couldn't possibly share the gospel. And yet, of course, the early church grew in a dramatic way through the testimony of normal people sharing their story of the difference Jesus had made in their life. All of us could do that. So prayer, care, share. And then lastly, now where? It's always good to think, if I've had a chance to speak to someone and say something, even just something small about Jesus, there's an opportunity to think, okay, now where? What next? And this is one of the reasons that we, we regularly have um, evangelistic events and things like invitation services here in, in our church. There's a whole bunch of things coming up in, in the run-up to Christmas. It's so easy to say, oh, hang on a minute, that, that person that I prayed for and cared for, I had a chance the other week to say something about Jesus to them. It would now be so natural and so easy to follow up and say, hey, you know that conversation we had the other week? We were talking about Jesus. Do you know, we, we've got a service coming up in, in two weeks in our church, and it's kind of set up, it's called an invitation service. It's kind of geared up for those people who wouldn't normally go to church. Do you want to come? Let's go together. Prayer, care, share, and now where. And by God's grace, through the witness of his people, we will have chances to share the gospel so others might come to know Jesus for themselves. So glory might be brought to God and his church might be grown and expanded. Let's pray, shall we, together? Maybe let's just take a moment of quiet. We can reflect on those around us, those we don't know, those we know who don't know Jesus. Perhaps we can, in the quiet, begin to pray for them. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your grace, the gospel has reached us. As we move in a moment to take bread and wine and reflect on the cross, we thank you that Jesus went to the cross for us, that when he was persecuted and beaten and bruised and suffered, he didn't retaliate. We thank you that he went willingly to die for our sin in our place. Father, we know that if the good news of Jesus has reached us, by your grace it can reach others. And so we bring to you now all these people who are in our minds right now. Those colleagues at work. Those friends in our village. The family who are dear to us. And Lord, we pray that you would give us opportunities to care for them, to share with them that they too might come to know the grace of Jesus and the forgiveness he offers. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, before we come to uh, share bread and wine in the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing once again. Here's a wonderful hymn. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch, that's us, his treasure. Shall we stand together? Let's sing. Jesus.
come to uh, the final part of our time together as we share in the Lord's Supper. Uh, So if you've got your little uh, pots of bread and wine, now's the time to have those to hand. Uh, You might ask, what is the Lord's Supper? Uh, Well, there's a wonderful moment in the Westminster Larger Catechism that asks exactly that question. The question is, what is the Lord's Supper? And the answer is this. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament of the New Testament wherein by giving and receiving of bread and wine according to the appointment of Jesus his death is showed forth and they that worthily communicate feed upon his body and blood to their spiritual nourishment and growth in grace have their communion and union with him confirmed and renew their thankfulness, their engagement with God and their mutual love and fellowship with each other as members of one body. I can't think of a better summary of all that this meal is. You might ask who should participate in this meal well if you are someone who knows and trusts the Lord Jesus as your saviour and you are wholeheartedly following him as Lord in your life then this is a meal for you this is not my table it's not Burghead Free Church's table it's not the Free Church of Scotland's table this is the Lord's table and if you belong to him you are welcome here If you're not, or or not yet, a Christian, or you're not sure if you are, then we'd encourage you not to take bread and wine at this time. This is a meal, after all, that comes with a warning. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. But to those who trust in Christ, Jesus himself says to us, draw near with faith. Receive the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray together. We do not presume to come to this, your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant mercies. Lord, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, 
but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. So we pray that you would grant us gracious Lord so to eat these signs and symbols of the flesh and blood of your dear son, Jesus Christ, that as we look to him and to the cross, our sinful bodies may be made clean, our souls may be washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. The Apostle Paul, again, writing in 1 Corinthians, says these words. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let me invite you to take and eat the bread in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let me invite you to take and drink in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you. And Jesus finished by saying, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We remember that this meal points us forward to the great feast of heaven, when all of God's people will be with him in joy, with no pain and no suffering any longer. Let's pray again together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you came to meet us in your son and brought us home. Keep us firm, we pray in the hope that you have set before us so that we and all your people shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to close... Uh, by singing those well-known words, well-known to to many of us anyway, from Psalm 72. They reflect on the name of God. And of course, the name of God is synonymous with the character of God. His name forever shall endure. Last, like the sun it shall, men shall be blessed in him and blessed all nations shall him call. So shall we stand as we sing? His name forever shall endure, last like the sun it shall, men shall.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Please do sit. Let me again thank you for being with us in person and uh, online. Uh, Don't forget, uh, ladies in the Ladies' Guild, if you're going to the Christmas meal, uh, let Alison know. Um, Don't forget to take your service sheets away with you. Bear in mind there's no Wednesday evening meeting this week, but come and join us on Friday for a whole day. And uh, if you wouldn't mind putting your plastic pots uh, in the red box on the way out, that would be great. (laughs) 